Hello and welcome to the video lecture for Unit 1 of Chemistry 1045, General Chemistry 1. Uh, this unit is entitled Introduction to Chemistry and Measurement. Now the first thing we probably should do before starting off on a chemistry course is define what chemistry is. So if you do a quick internet search on what is chemistry or look up the definition of a of chemistry in a dictionary, you'll get something along the lines that chemistry is the science of matter and the changes that it undergoes. Now we are certainly going to discuss this at length in this course. We're going to discuss matter and the changes um, that happen to it or that can happen to it. Uh, one additional thing that we should incorporate is the idea of energy. And certainly chemistry studies the uh, effect of energy um, on this process. Uh, anytime matter undergoes a change, there is going to be an associated energy transfer or energy change uh, along with that process. So of course we're going to want to be able to study that and discuss the uh, outcomes uh, of those processes. Uh, before we start talking about uh, energy, I guess we should probably disguise, di discuss or define what matter is. Now, I like to uh, jokingly say that matter is anything that is stuff. Okay, If you see stuff, it is matter. Uh, a little bit more formal definition of matter would be anything, any objects that take up space, occupy, occupy some space, take up volume, um, or that has a mass. And um, that would be a pretty good definition of matter. Now as you can see that can uh, be used to discuss a lot of things. That's why I like to say that it is anything that is stuff. So anything that takes up space and or has mass. Hey, what forms can that matter come in? Actually, there's a lot of types of matter uh, that we can stop, discuss. Um, but in the chemistry course, we're going to be focused on the atom or matter in the, uh, in the uh, form of atoms, the building block of the stuff you see every day. Uh, atoms can be put together to form molecules or compounds. And we'll also discuss uh, matter in all of those forms. Uh, before we get going on uh, a continuation talk of matter and or energy and the changes that it undergoes, uh, we should take a step back and actually talk about the process in which all of the concepts and knowledge that we're going to discuss this course um, have underwent. And that, of course, is the scientific method. All of the knowledge that we learn about this semester has been vetted through this very rigorous process that we call the scientific method. Now scientific method starts with observations. Now if you're studying a system and want to find out more about uh, the matter or the energy associated with the uh, changes that matter undergoes, you're going to start off with observations. And these are of course, these are detailed notes about the system that you're studying. And that's sort of your starting point for this scientific method. Once you've uh, formed these detailed notes, these observations, you might want to be able to come up with an explanation uh, for this problem or system that you're studying. Um, and that explanation is what we term a hypothesis. Any explanation that's based on observations is a hypothesis. Now going forward, we're going to want to sort of prove this hypothesis. 
Now another important aspect of the hypothesis, in order to be proved, this explanation must be testable. Or another term would be falsifiable. We're going to want to go into the lab, usually, and figure out if our hypothesis is true or not. For that to happen, we have to set up some sort of way to test our hypothesis. Uh, the testing phase of the scientific method is, of course, the experimental stage. And this is what we're going to do to prove our hypothesis. Now, uh, tests that prove or turn, cause our hypothesis to be true um, validate our hypothesis, cause it to be true. Uh, we can also uh, carry out experiments that might cause us to think that our hypothesis is wrong or invalidate our hypothesis. And either of those is fine. We want to find out uh, the facts of the concepts, um, essentially determining if our hypothesis is true or not. So we need to be able to figure out either or. Now, you can see that there's two possible outcomes uh, at the experimental stage. Um, if our hypothesis has been proven correct or validated through the experiment stage, uh, our hypothesis now becomes a theory. So our explanation that once was a hypothesis is now referred to as a theory because it is based on experimental results or data. Now in the grand scheme of things, um, theories are accepted as truth, um, whereas hypotheses need, of course, uh, further experimentation, further experimental results. So theories are, of course, um, you could say, better accepted than hypotheses. Uh, and you can very, very well see the big difference. As we said uh, before, the hypotheses were based on observations. Theories are based on experimental results or data. Now you can see, if we go back to the experimental stage, you can see that, well, of course our experimental results could have invalidated our hypothesis. Now what happens if that is the case? Well, the scientific method isn't a linear process. It's a um, somewhat circular process in that we can, of course, uh, go back to the observation stage, make more detailed notes uh, to, say, further um, uh, to better our hypothesis or to come up with a new one. We can go back to the hypothesis stage, uh, come up with a better hypothesis based on our observations, then retest them at the experimental uh, stage. All in all, going for uh, putting forth a better and better theory. Um, this idea or this general um, scheme is shown in this figure here uh, in that uh, the stages that happen um, can be seen here. Okay, uh, over here on the on the right, uh, a very important aspect in that a theory isn't the the end all be all step of the scientific method. Uh, we can constantly improve our knowledge of a system, our knowledge of a chemical concept, uh, through further experiments. Uh, so theories aren't the final last word, even though they're certainly. Uh, true in the most, uh, in the strictest sense of the word, we can just find out more and better information about them. Uh, uh, we'll look at the uh, history of atomic theory and we'll constantly see uh, e examples where theories were constantly being improved upon by further experimentation um, from Dalton to J.J. Thompson to Ernest Rutherford's nuclear model, which is primarily correct. Okay. Uh, one thing that I haven't discussed so far is that there, of course, are laws, which is sort of an antiquated um, terminology. You don't see those too often in modern science. Uh, but a series of similar observations uh, or even experimental results 
can sort of pile up and develop into a scientific law. Um, two such laws that we should immediately talk about are the law of conservation of mass and the law of conservation of energy. And the law of conservation of energy. Now both of these laws basically say the same thing. Now they're put forth by you know many 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 observations, many 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 experimental results, and that any time that you do a chemical reaction, uh, you cannot create or destroy matter, and that is of course the law of conservation of mass. Uh, if you do a chemical reaction where you know A is reacting goes to B, the mass of your starting materials will always equal the mass of your final product, your ending materials. Uh, we can't create or destroy mass. Uh, going hand in hand with that is of course the law of conservation of energy, meaning that you cannot create or destroy energy. Energy can only be transferred from one system to another. Um, and those will be the you know two hallmark laws of science. Um, that we'll need to continually go back to and will aid us in our discussion of a lot of concepts 